focus in primarily and um, ch changed over to working with adults in the further education sector in the UK about 20 years ago. And she became involved in ALM because of her current research about 10 years ago, which was just the sort of people we want to gather to the ALM family. Um, and so she's she's always been adding to people's discussion about this very special area that that brings together the language of and, and, and teaching mathematics and numeracy, which is both the language that's being used about the mathematics, but also very importantly, the languages that are found in the adult numeracy class and of combining those both, both those approaches. And it is always quite so important when you're going in there wondering whether what you're saying is being understood at all. Um, it's always been a pleasure working with her um, in the different in, in, in different organizations and different uh, conferences. And uh, I think we're going to have a great treat. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you very much, David. That's very kind. Yes, it was the Washington conference uh, where I first presented um, for ALM and, uh, and that was on my master's research work. Um, what you're seeing today um, is the result of my doctoral studies. Um, I'm now doing a doctorate in education at Sheffield Hallam University and um, can everyone see the screen okay? Can somebody give me a thumbs up? Excellent. And can you hear me all right? Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. So um, the research work that I've done so far has been around adults uh, whose first language is not English and their experiences of, of studying mathematics in England, in English, um, and what that was like for them. And then I've also done some work on uh, the differences between different mathematical languages, because the languages, you would think that maths was a ubiquitous language, that it was global, but in fact it isn't. Uh, we use different words for the number operations, people use different symbols for the number operations, there are lots of differences. Now one of the things that I found very interesting while I was opening up this little can of worms, as we say in Britain, um, was that a lot of the non-first language English speakers that came into class had very much more confidence and less anxiety around mathematics than my native English speakers. And what I've done now is I've kind of moved my research across so that I'm now studying the English language speakers alongside the non-first language English speakers and comparing the differences. So that this has been just so interesting for me, it really is interesting. I find the whole area absolutely fascinating anyway, which will probably come across in this presentation. So the people that I've done this research work around are just adults, by which I mean 19 plus. So this is not the 16 to 18 year old provision, which I also do teach in further education colleges but this has just been about the adults, the 19 plus learners coming in to study GCSE mathematics in colleges in England. And I've been looking at their self-efficacy, which means their confidence in their ability, their anxiety levels around mathematics and examinations. And I'm comparing that with their final examination grades, because what I wanted to find out was is their self-efficacy or their anxiety actually relevant to their final grade? In other words, does it matter? Does it matter? Or is it actually something that just goes with the territory? OK, now you are seeing here provisional findings. For those of you who are gamers, this is a sneak peek. OK, so you are seeing the findings before I have finished writing them up and also before I've had my viva for my doctoral studies. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, excellent. So setting the scene. 
this GCSE mathematics, this is a level two qualification. It's normally taken in secondary schools by 16 year olds, but it is a marker examination in the UK for university entrance. People who want to go on into university to study say nursing or teaching or anything else are normally expected to have this mathematics at a pass along with English, of course, and various other qualifications. But these 19 plus learners, these are adults who are coming back into education. They're on non-traditional pathways into higher education. A lot of the learners that I see, they do want to go on to nursing degree or a social work degree or become a teaching assistant or a teacher, um, but they are coming back into it later on in life. So they are non-traditional learners. Very often they're looking to expand their opportunities in terms of their earnings or secure employment. Um, they're, they're all sorts of courses that they're wanting to go on to, um, usually at degree level, but some of them come in um, and they are already working at master's level and they haven't got a GCSE in mathematics and they've been told by their university that they won't be awarded their master's degree unless they have got it. So they are, are forced, if you like, to come in and study the subject, whether they want to or not. Now, astonishingly in England, there are over 30,000 of these adults who come into the provision every year, over 30,000. And that is around 10% of the total who are studying that GCSE mathematics qualification. The other quarter of a million or so, those are all the 16, 17 year olds who are doing it in schools. The, the college numbers, those 30,000, it does include people in further education, which is where my specialist area is, but it also includes sixth form colleges and vocational or specialist colleges out in the community, such as agricultural colleges. Okay, um, it also includes union provision. Uh, there is also some provision uh, by local government and it includes those as well. In colleges, it can follow on from functional skills provision, which is like a lead into the GCSE mathematics provision, but Colleges are being moved away from that because the funding for functional skills is lower than it is for GCSE. So colleges are being encouraged to put everybody, regardless of their ability, in front of this GCSE mathematics exam, um, even though it includes things like uh, fraction, a lot of fraction work and it includes algebra and geometry, which they may not be ready for at all. Um, but they're being encouraged to do that because the funding is greater. And that is something that I have, I have deep worries and reservations about. And when I've got this doctorate, I will be campaigning for this to change. OK, um, English and maths up to level two in the UK are fully funded by the government, regardless of your age, your gender or your nationality. So which is fantastic because it's an opportunity for our non-first language English speakers, regardless of their age, to study a free course in the English language, although it's the qualification, of course, is maths, not English. English for speakers of other languages now not funded in the UK. Uh, that was taken away from us around 2008, 2009, when we went into the financial uh, crisis, shall I call it? Okay. So there we are. Now, I've looked at the literature with regard to these learners, as you would expect on a doctorate to edu in education. So one of the things that emerges very clearly from the literature is the motivation of adults who are coming back into further education to study GCSE mathematics. This contrasts very greatly with the 16 to 18 year olds who have to do it as part of their provision. In England, their main vocational provision in college is not funded unless they attend GCSE English and maths classes until they have got that pass grade. Okay, so they are, they are forced to study this subject. 
but for adults they come back in to do it of their own volition so their motivation is very different some of them have intrinsic um, some of them have extrinsic uh, motivations so intrinsic motivations might mean midlife changes they could never do maths at school so they want to come back um, and have another go at it um, other intrinsic motivations could just be they want to keep their brains sticking over and uh, and it's a subject that has interested them but they didn't get the qualification that they thought they they warranted at school so and then we've dealt with the extrinsic motivations the, the social and economic drivers there are lots of psychological aspects around studying mathematics and a lot of research work has been done on this self-efficacy confidence about their ability the research work there tends to be on how they feel about certain calculations within mathematics. So I'm thinking about the work of Michael Swan here and also of Colin Foster just recently. They, um, what they've done in their research is they give you a little mathematical task mm -hmm. to do and then they ask you how confident you feel that your answer is correct. Okay, this self-efficacy um, gathering has been slightly different. Lots of research work has been done on mathematics anxiety. And this is very long standing now, isn't it? From the 1970s forward, 50 years of research now um, on anxiety in mathematics. The links between success and confidence has also been looked at. Low attainment is very often associated with disaffection and anxiety and performance are linked. This is the, um, the work of Dolby on low attainment and disaffection, the work of Ashcraft on more on anxiety and performance. If we are very anxious about something, it impacts on our ability to engage properly with it. And uh, that can affect our performance in a negative way. So lots and lots of research to look at. It's been quite hard to, um, to be selective about the literature that I've looked at. Some of the research that's emerged and all of these three references here on older learners being more anxious than younger learners are from the USA because the States has done a lot of work on this. Uh, we, we tend to lag behind a little perhaps in the UK on this, although there is some good work out there. Um, older learners more anxious than younger ones. So that's Betts, Jameson and Fusco and Watts, I say all USA. Some of the UK um, Research does disagree with that, including the work of Evans, uh, where he found that um, actually uh, it wasn't necessarily so, um, though he was more interested in um, females and males on the gender side of it. Um, and females generally have been found to be more anxious than males, um, particularly within the school community. Um, it becomes more, more mixed. As, as the learners age, as we deal with older learners. There has been rather a deficit view as well in the literature. Kassaint et al, again, that's USA. Uh, Kassaint and her colleagues, they're based in uh, the Miami, Florida area of the States, and they have a lot of non-first language English speakers, mainly Spanish speakers. And uh, their work is really interesting, really interesting. And uh, so yes, a deficit for view of the EAL ESOL learners, uh, which I must say has been substantiated by my previous research as well, because I have found that, um, for instance, I had a, a master's uh, degree um, gentleman from Poland with a master's in mathematics, and he struggled to get an entry three qualification, which is least two layers below um, the, the GCSE mathematics that we're talking about today. Okay, so data collection and analysis. I've used a mixed method research approach. I've collected quantitative data. I had a questionnaire of 15 statements based on the abbreviated maths anxiety scale. For those of you who are interested in this work and want to have a look at that. And then I have popped in some additions of my own. Each statement has been given to the participants twice, once for self-efficacy and once for anxiety. And they've been asked to uh, rank their feelings on a scale for each. So the self-efficacy scale is ranked from very confident to I definitely can't do this. 
and that's based on the work of Swan. And the anxiety scale is based, uh, it goes from no anxiety to highly anxious. And that's based on the work of Hopko. Okay, so I've, I've kind of drawn strands from various places. In the qualitative part of the data gathering, I have had a comment section after each question. So the, um, the participant has had the opportunity to comment after every single uh, ranking. Okay, and there's also been a comments box at the end of the questionnaire. And then I have offered interviews to all of the participants so that they could expand on anything um, that they wanted to, to clarify or correct or anything. Um, so that that opportunity was given to all of them. The analysis is largely thematic and I've used Braun and Clark's work for that. There are three main themes. Firstly, classroom dynamics. How do they feel about being in the classroom? Can they ask a question in class? How do they feel about watching their teacher working on the board? Those kinds of questions. Then we have some questions on course content, and those are based on um, the kinds of things that we know that our learners struggle with, such as percentages, such as fractions. There's a question on algebra. There's another one on word problems. Okay, there's also a question on charts and graphs. Um, and then finally, the, th the third main theme is on assessment. So that's looking at tests, quizzes in class, the final examination for mathematics and um, those kinds of questions. And then I've also included a question on um, examinations that are not about mathematics, because one of the things I'm really interested in is whether this is um, anxiety or lack of confidence in their ability is about mathematics examinations or is about examinations generally. And I think that's a gap in the research that is, is currently unfilled. So that will be part of what I am covering in future presentations, probably not in this one. Okay, so that's data collection and analysis. Participants, I got 21 participants in total, 31 of them, uh, sorry, there were 31 questionnaire responses, which means that 10 of the participants answered the questionnaire more than once. And I'm going to talk about those differences between the two questionnaire responses at my presentation in Limerick, if it is accepted for the ALM conference. Okay, so that, that how, how participants' perceptions of their ability and of their anxiety levels, how they change over the duration of the course, that will be in a further subsequent um, presentation. And I hope to do a, a research paper on that as well for the ALM journal, uh, because that's really interesting. Thank you, Linda. Yes, thumbs up there, good. <laughs> okay. Only one of my participants came forward for interview. Now that is quite interesting in a way. They obviously felt that they had done enough when they put all those comments on the questionnaires. And many of them did comment on their questionnaires. Um, and I think it's Creswell who talks about um, commenting on a questionnaire as being, as being a form of interviewing. I should be you know, using that one heavily, obviously, in my Viva. Okay, over 900 ranked responses, and I have also over 120 comments. Okay, so there's pl been plenty to analyze and to go at. I have split um, the uh, comments and the ranked responses out by learners' characteristics. Now, I appreciate that these are very small groups, but it was still of interest for me to look at these to look at the younger learners, how they were responding, to look at those who were 25 years and over. I've also split it out by gender, so to look at the responses of the males and compare those with the responses of the females. And then I've also looked at our special area of interest this evening, which is the L1 learners. Now, L1 learners are native English speakers, but native and English, well, English speakers is okay. Um, the, the English speakers who responded were all born and raised in the UK, in England. Um, I can't say the, the 
yeah, I can't say the UK actually, they were all born and raised in England, but some of them may not have been, they might have been Scotland or Canada or America, those would still be English speakers. Okay, I'm contrasting those English speaking learners with LX learners. And by LX, this is the work of Diwali. Um, he talks about protecting identity by using LX. So my few four non-first language English speakers, rather than referring to them as learners from say Poland or Eastern European learners or, or whatever they were, or Asian learners or Chinese learners, I can protect their identity to an extent, extent by just referring to them as LX learners. And, uh, and I'm really happy with this um, interpretation and I shall be using this a lot in the future. Okay, now uh, limitations of this research, obviously there is a potential here for volunteer bias. Spiegel Halter talks a lot about volunteer bias. And I must say, I think that is, that is really interesting and uh, uh, well worth having a look at if you're going to do research because it does seem clear that certain social groups are much more likely to respond to requests to participate in questionnaires and surveys than other uh, social groups are well worth a look. It's also a small sample um, size and it was also influenced by the pandemic because guess when I was collecting my main data? Oh yes the 2020-2021 academic year. Okay, marvellous. So findings by age, gender and first language. So this is a small sample size and these are provisional findings. Okay, the 19 to 24 year olds had very similar SE, self-efficacy, confidence in their ability, but their anxiety was higher and they were less likely to pass, and one of them withdrew. On gender, the males generally had lower self-efficacy. They also had higher anxiety than the females. They had a very similar pass rate. There were no male withdrawals. The females overall higher self-efficacy. So generally the females who responded to the questionnaire had more confidence in their ability than the males did. Generally also, they had lower anxiety, but the two people who withdrew from the course, so out of my 21, there were two withdrawals, and the three who could not ask a question in class were all female. Now, this asking a question in class is one part of the AMAS um, short survey, but it's usual with these survey forms to look at the responses as a whole rather than the individual um, parts of that themselves and this inability to ask a question in class is is absolutely devastating isn't it for adult learners you know if, if they cannot ask about something they have not understood as as a teacher i just feel that's that's terrible isn't it and i was so surprised and this was not specific to people who had low skills. One of the people who would not ask a question in class um, did really well in the examination. She got one of the top grades, but she still could not ask a question. I was just astonished. And then the other thing that was very surprising from the data I collected was that the, the LX learners, the non-first language English speakers, their self-efficacy was higher their anxiety generally was lower and they had a higher pass rate than my English speakers. One of them did withdraw, okay? Um, but everyone else, they, they just, they didn't conform. These findings contrast with pre some previous research. These, these learners who participated, they did not conform. So findings and recommendations. I have not always surveyed my learners. I've done it in some academic years and then in others I have not. And I, th I think now that is a loss. I think I need to be using the abbreviated maths anxiety scale or a similar scale that I have devised myself. I just feel I need to be out there and I need to be, 
asking them how they feel about the mathematics, whether it's about their confidence in their ability or their anxiety, how they feel about the examinations, how they feel about tests. Can they put their hand up in class? If, if they cannot put their hand up, I feel as a practitioner, I need to know about that because those are the learners I would have to go around the room and check that they had understood just quietly, you know, not make a big fuss about it or call them out in class, but I just want to be there saying, everything okay, are you all right to move on? And uh, yeah, working the room, keeping an open mind about learners. My previous research has indicated that People whose first language is, isn't English are at a disadvantage in those classrooms, but clearly that was not the case for these learners. And these weren't all my learners. These were drawn across different teachers and different colleges. The, these were not my students. Some of them were, admittedly, but, but not some of the LX learners. And, and I worry about stereotypical assumptions and whether that impacts on the way I work with learners in the classroom. So keeping an open mind, I think, is really, really helpful. The other issue with stereotypical assumptions is that they can encourage conformity to a stereotype. And Holloway talks about this in his research work. So, and that also would be detrimental in the classroom, wouldn't it? So there's stereotypical behavior from myself, but also from the learners. Um, yes. Males may be just as anxious as the females, and that makes sense, doesn't it? Because so far, these people have failed in the same way. They have not got this grade four, as it is in Britain, this magic step, stepping stone into university um, and into further study. Um, so maybe that's, that's right that they should be just as anxious as the females. And they certainly were here, one of my most anxious um, participants was male um, and he made the most astonishing number of comments and clearly he had a lot on his chest and a lot that he wanted to share so males may be just as anxious the LX learners the non-first language English speakers there's something here isn't there about the relationship between the English language the amount of English they've got and the amount of mathematics they've got and how you judge those two things and what you do about these non-first language English speakers. And there was one student who in my class um, last year, her mathematics was very good. She would have probably, if she had done the higher paper, because in, in Britain we're split between two papers, a higher paper or a foundation paper. She would probably have got a better grade than she did on the foundation paper if she had done the higher tier paper. But because she was in the classroom, because she wanted to improve her English, there was more English language on the foundation paper. So she wanted to do that. So there's something, isn't there, about what are, the, what are these LX learners, these non-first language English speakers, what are they hoping to get out of these classes? And can we match the examinations that we give them to, to help them with whatever their target is, because it might not be anything to do with the mathematics. This might be, they might be in the classroom for very, very different reasons. Okay, and then the other thing is, age is unlikely to be a marker for success or failure. The younger learners may be at just as much or more risk. There is an issue here with the young people who are coming through now as well about the pandemic and about the uncertainty about external examinations, because some of them have not sat a lot of external examinations now. They've also had reduced social contact over the period of, of the pandemic. And, uh, and we're finding, um, certainly in my college, that um, some of those learners who are coming through have very much more concerned than they used to be about, about college life, um, about their social interactions with other young people. And those will feed into our adult classes. So uh, some of those, you know, as they feed through who've been affected by the pandemic, um, that will need care and watching, I think, as though way they work through the system. Some learners have really low self-efficacy and high anxiety. And 
This is about building a community of learning for those who will benefit from it. One of the things that has seemed to be quite effective, um, certainly in my classrooms, is some learners have got together and set up a WhatsApp group. And so they've had, they've had a way of interacting with each other that's outside of the classroom and away from me. And that's been really useful because through teaching through the pandemic, not all the classes have run because if there's been a sudden outbreak, we've had to go online. If they've got a WhatsApp group, they're not relying on their student emails or whatever, they can communicate with each other. So if, if I know one person has picked it up, they can cascade that then to the rest of the group. And we, we found that really helpful, that building of community. Some of them really seem to need that additional support. Now, obviously that's a very mixed thing, isn't it? Because others definitely don't want that. Those who have social issues, um, maybe are on the autistic continuum somewhere, they do not want to um, react with their, or interact with their peers. So something we have to be careful about, but I think um, a sense of community for those who need it can be really beneficial. There were lots of issues that arose, and I will talk more about this um, in subsequent presentations around fractions, percentages, algebra, charts and graphs, and wordy problems. <laughs> so word problems on examination papers. Responses to the course content was very, very varied. I do wonder if spiky profiles, and this is one of my questions that we're going to discuss in the uh, breakout rooms, if spiky profiles, as are used in ESOL or English language teaching, will be a useful way to look at these learners because all adults bring strengths and weaknesses with them. And we saw this, didn't we, in Catherine's presentation with her, her prisoners um, the last time. The, um, they bring strengths with them. And if we can exploit their strengths and highlight their strengths, we may help to build their self-efficacy. And, uh, and I think that could be something that's really well worth looking at. Word problems, so things, that, Word problems such as if it takes three people five days to fit a kitchen, how long will it take two people? And that was the example I used in my questionnaire. And the responses to that were, were almost uniformly unhappy. So one of the things that Barwell talks about in his research work is about asking learners to devise their own word problems test them, find out the answer. You could even start with the answer and then work out a question. Ask them to do that in twos and threes if they're happy to work like, work like that. And then ask them to swap them over. So give them to a peer in, or, or a pair of other learners, swap yours over so you, they're answering your word problem, you're answering theirs. Now we'd have to be quite careful about that because we'd we'd need to be very aware of the language that is employed by um, our exam boards and it differs across exam boards. So we'd need to know about that. Uh, we'd need to have some key words up on the board, I think, um, that would need to be incorporated into their word problems. And it also might be very useful to develop a template to do that. So it was structured in the way that the exam board would structure it. But I do wonder if that might be something that is useful to incorporate for our first language English speakers um, as a technique. So, okay, and here are my references and I hope I haven't run on too much. Okay, there's, oops, two pages of references there. Please, please do email me. I'm on stillknitting at gmail.com. It's on my website. If you want to get in touch, if you want to ask about any references, please, please do. Okay, right. Shall I stop sharing my screen? <laughs>